One of the most crucial weeks in recruiting can be a team's bye week. How well did Dave Aranda utilize his? This is Locked On Baylor. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to Locked On Baylor. Thank you for making this show your first listen every single day, especially to start your week off. I'm Drake Toll with Inside the Bears alongside John Garcia Jr. from Sports Illustrated. And John, before we really jump into things, I do want to make note that in SI's Class of 2023 rankings, Baylor is the number one new Big 12 team there. We're going to get to that today, but first... I like that that qualifier. That's Yeah, that's, yeah. You've been saying that? Is that how we're doing it? New Big 12, got it. Yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> we, we, we got to skew it to whatever makes it sound good for Baylor um, because Texas and Oklahoma are surprised uh, ahead of the Bears in those rankings. But uh, that's just a teaser to what we will get to because what's pertinent now is the bye week and how college football teams use the bye week to to recruit are, are you seeing this as one of the more crucial weeks for recruiting or does this feel like somewhere where especially power five teams are honing in on the in-house own team stuff in the middle of the year Look, we all know Dave Aranda is a sharp cat, right? So this is going to be a little bit of both, right? Coming off of a loss, trying to get things back on track. You you always expect, hey, we're going to spend a little bit more time in-house to, to make sure things look good here going forward, correct correct the mistakes. But it's also just more time. And, and when it comes to more time for coaches who get it, and certainly Dave gets mm-hmm. it, Recruiting is always going to be the next thing, maybe the first thing in, in in this regard, not necessarily Baylor, but just this year in trying to take advantage of, of a bye week. So I do think that there's some loose ends in the class of 2023, right? I mean, there's a couple targets still out there. Uh, so maybe you go and you hit the road uh, to some of their games and, and you send your staff out on Thursday and or Friday nights, or you double down on your verbal commitments. And I think that's where we've already seen Baylor – really hit their stride in 2023, right? A lot of programs have uh, circled back on on Baylor football commitments. Uh, Austin Novosad, of course, the most notable, but it's not quite done, right? There's still other kids out there that are getting inquiries from other programs. I mean, I just saw uh, Torian York, the linebacker, is, is still taking other visits or talking about taking other visits as other programs continue uh, to, to show him some love. So that's something that you always want to consider almost first before hitting some of those uh, uncommitted targets that are still out there. And I think on defense, there's a couple spots left in this class of 23. But with that being said, now you can also maybe take an early stab at 2024. Do you go see DJ Lagway and, and kind of double down on that uh, early target uh, to, for, for that legacy prospects and, and kind of remind him, hey, um, not only do we expect you to come visit us, we'll, we'll come see you as well. So do you you plan out as much as you can there. And we're still looking back from the weekend to see just where all the bear coaches ended up. Uh, but you do expect them to hit the road hard and, and reemphasize either remaining priorities in 23 or early priorities in 24. Whatever happened to the Chad Morris recruit helicopter at SF, you remember the, the recruit helicopter and he kind of phased that out at Arkansas and how did that not catch on across the country? <laughs> I think, hey, look, these budgets are tight. I think it, it just depends on the program, right? Theoretically, if you've got the, the helicopter, you can do that at SMU, right? Because you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro. You can hit three, four, five schools in a few hours and, and be good. But if you're recruiting for a more, you know, a wider base, which I think the pandemic kind of forced a lot of programs to at least try – to stretch out that recruiting footprint to a degree, uh, you can't really do the helicopter hop anymore, right? Because these targets are fewer and further in between. Uh, and obviously financially after the pandemic as well, I think a lot of uh, athletic departments said, well, do we need this? Is this, you know, it's a great social media video, but do we need this? Uh, so, you know, look, Saban and Kirby Smart are still doing it a little bit. But it's definitely not the trend that maybe we thought it was going to be in 2019 before everything reset from from a financial perspective in particular. But look, I wouldn't rule it out. Right. You know, when we get closer to signing day and we're just over two months away, I do think that's that's going to rear its head one more time, especially when the in-home visits period opens up uh, at the end of November. 
I'm just making sure that Dave Aranda not being on a helicopter during his bye week was an okay thing. I didn't know if that was still like a popular popular uh, thing for coaches to do. I think Chad Morris is now utilizing his to get away from Allen High School after they start losing games. Um, that's look, grew up an Arkansas fan, so any any little dig that we can get in there, we try. But looking at at Aranda and his staff this week, you know, Sean Bell is just he he works and he works in recruiting. Um, one thing that sticks out to me though this week. It feels like you're missing. It doesn't. Even, it is. You are missing Joey McGuire. That is a sure. huge hole in your recruiting that is completely gone out of the bye week. He would have been that guy that is at seven different high schools on a Friday night because he was just that that wired that way. Um, are, are you seeing him emulate that at Texas Tech over the course of this season? Out of what you're getting from that program and. Is there really any way from your perspective to gauge how how Baylor has been affected by that loss? I know you already got Josh Fleeks, who's transferring from Baylor, uh, likely to Texas Tech, and Joey McGuire because of Joey McGuire. Right. Look, I mean, I think that impact can't be understated, right? Everyone, you know, raved about him at Baylor because of, of that work ethic and those connections. And as soon as the tech job opened up, it look, it was just as 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 much as you could hit the ground running in recruiting, he did because of purely his reputation, right? I think they had like 13 commitments yeah. like before signing day uh, in this class of 23. So he was just trying to finish up 22 and he was already rolling in, in 2023. And that's because of who he is, right? And obviously Lubbock is unique, uh, West Texas. It, it, it's something different than just about every other option in state, especially in the Big 12. So I do think that he capitalized on on that niche factor. And, and look, I think they've got still – the, not only the biggest class in the Big 12, but they still got, I think, the biggest class in the country. So yeah. a, a lot of West Texans are are on board there, and that's just something that he is expecting to sort of shore up uh, under that Texas Tech umbrella. So in that regard, yeah, really hard to duplicate it, right? Um, but Baylor's done a really great job. 20 of these kids on, on the 23 commitment list are Texans. Um, you've hit all of the major metro areas, whether it's Dallas or Houston, and of course there's still some targets uh, there remaining. So I do think from, from a geographical perspective, you don't see the direct fallout in losing Joey McGuire, especially with with what Baylor has has brought at the very top of of its arsenal from from Dave Aranda on down, I think you can withstand some of that, but it's never going to be the same, right? And you have to adjust accordingly. So maybe you go outside of the Texas footprint just a little bit more. We've seen that, right? They go west to Arizona. You're going east uh, into other states, all the way to really to Louisiana, where we're seeing a relatively consistent Baylor presence so you start to tweak the approach just a little bit and, and you recruit from a, a bit of a wider uh, footprint if, if you're Baylor it's not just all about those Texans even though that is going to overwhelmingly be the foundation of, of every single recruiting class that you bring in so it's more of an adjustment and a tweak kind of like a game plan right as opposed to oh man we lost this connection and now we're, we're dead in that area it's, it's really never that simple or as extreme as the reputation may suggest. Mm. That's good. That's certainly a good sign because that's been a worry for myself for the last couple of weeks. And obviously, McGuire is one of the best recruiters in in college. even if it is quantity over quality right now. There's still a recipe there to to build a program at Texas Tech, which is scary for Baylor fans, by the way. Uh, even getting away from Baylor, though, how do how can a staff win the bye week in recruiting? I think it's so much about perception, Drake. That showing up. Right. I mean, t mandating coaches to hit the road Thursday and Friday, you know, in, in a perfect world, but at least on Friday. Right. Yeah. I mean, show show that that logo, those colors. My green is off. I apologize. Show those colors on, on these these amazing Texas Friday Night Lights fields on on a Friday or beyond or stretch it. Right. Stretch it. Go, go to Louisiana. Right. There's a couple of Shreveport kids on defense that Baylor likes that visited over the summer. Go go show up there at Northwood High School or, or whatever it is. Go show up and show the colors uh, and kind of remind folks hey, that this, this thing is not this thing isn't a was or in past tense. This is still very much in the present tense. And I think there should still be a, a ton of excitement when it comes uh, to Baylor football. So just kind of go fly the flag, if you will, uh, over the bye week. I think that's a good way to double down in person. But of course, uh, it's, it's always more about internally and what you don't see, right? It's always about 
outside of perception work? Are we checking in with the verbal commitments? Are we sitting down with the Novosad family? Are we going uh, to to reach out to to these contacts and and reaffirm commitments and or gauge other prospects, whether committed elsewhere or still undecided? Hey, you know, can we sneak in and schedule some visits here going forward? So I think you expect to see those colors, and you also expected to see a little bit more traction in the future visit schedules for some of these recruits. So it's early to, to gauge the returns there, but that's what you expect to see pick up a little bit after the bye week because you just had a little bit more time to, to make those calls and texts and FaceTimes and uh, Twitter DMs. Yeah, you definitely see Sean Bell, Jeff Grimes, Eric Mateos, those guys getting out and about over the course of their bye week, which is a great sign. And it, it shows that the ball is still rolling for a team that is top 20 in SI's current rankings for the class of 23. But before we talk about that, John, i to tell the folks at home about Locked On's, one of their biggest sponsors now, LinkedIn Talent Solutions. So these days, everybody's looking for a job. Uh, Wisconsin is looking for a new head football coach. You go... <laughs> Wisconsin uh, Athletic Department, purple hashtag hiring frame. That's it. That's it. Purple hashtag hiring frame. You tell them that Locked On sent you, uh, and you open it out on LinkedIn Talent Solutions. If you need to find, whether you are or not the Wisconsin Athletic Department, uh, going there, you can find candidates a lot faster. Screening questions have you narrow everything down, like a big funnel that works for you, and it's rated number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. So millions of folks use this every single day. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find qualified candidates that you want to talk to faster, so post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash locked on college that is linkedin.com slash locked on college keep in mind terms and conditions do apply john i'll before i ask you are you surprised that baylor is number one in the new big 12 yes i adjusted the category (laughs) before i ask you i'm going to say the answer is should objectively be yes because i'm not gonna let you go ahead and toot baylor's horn here quite yet because i just baylor has never been a premier recruiting hub even even in Texas, they've always gotten, gotten lost in the shuffle in Texas and done more with less. Now they are trying to do more with more at number 16 in the in the country and number one in the new Big 12 over flashy coaches like Sonny Dykes or Mike Gundy with the mullet. Dave Aran is just this stoic character who now is recruiting at a high level, which to me is really surprising. Yeah, and it's and it's at the priority spots, right? I mean, this class is strong. It's big, right? What, 25 guys on board yeah. at the moment. But but look at where some of these numbers lie, Drake. Nine guys built for the trenches already committed. Obviously, mm-hmm. we, we, we're always talking about Austin Oversad at quarterback. And the biggest position group is in the secondary. So you talk about priority, premium level positional prospects that that's where they lie so yeah look there's no running backs committed you'd love to grab one late in the game if you can Mm -hmm. but not a huge deal if you don't right you've hit the priority marks and that running back room is pretty darn big and and loaded uh, already and you got the portal as well right always worth uh, a mention there but look the new big 12 is going to be funky in recruiting right i think there's really no way it's going to be conventional so i think building it from the inside out um, early identification and evaluations are going to benefit the smarter programs that are built for the long haul. And every indication with Baylor is that is it's one of those programs, right? So you're not chopping wood at the five-star receiver in, in Houston uh, like like TCU and Oklahoma State that are trying to upset Texas and OU, uh, but but you're chopping wood on on the O line and the D line with guys who. Uh, could be your your very next wave and and play sooner rather than later. So it's about it's not just about t- talent identification and those evaluations, but where are you stressing those resources? Where are you putting more time into shooting your shot with with a white whale you might not grab or the next tier down where hey this guy could be a starter in two years if he hits the right buttons and we believe we've hit the right ones in in identifying him and evaluating him let's put more resources there because now he commits a little bit earlier and now this class can build a little bit quicker and and i think that's where you're talking about a lot of the bell cows in this class committed at the turn of the year or up until the summer months right so that that huge window where the whole industry is turning the page to 2023 oh look Baylor's already got seven, eight, nine guys verbally committed, including their quarterback, by the way, yeah. who becomes the superstar recruit. So I think that is where you see the most Dave Aranda impact in, in these recruiting classes. So, yeah, you you start to build quantity early. 
So you get ranked high on the front end of it. And then as the class fills out and you see, you see these kids more and more, you say, Hey, um, there's a couple diamonds in the rough here with, yeah. with this group. And, and some of these Baylor commits can play anywhere. And that's just not something that we often say. So when you talk Austin Novoside and a Zay Robinson at offensive tackle, um, the, the linebacker Braithway, if I'm saying that right, yeah. these guys can play anywhere in the old or new Big 12, to, to bring it back to your terminology, with success early in their careers. Uh, and Baylor just happened to lock them in earlier than, than, than their recruitment uh, blowing up, right? They, they hit the timeline before – it got out of the Lone Star State and and the SEC schools got more involved and the Pac-12 schools got more involved. Before that point, Baylor was already prioritizing these guys. And a lot of times that's what it's about in recruiting. That's how you over recruit, if you will. And that's also how you hold off other programs when they realize, oh, yeah, this this Zay Robinson can play over here for us. So I think that's that's the nice formula and the consistent formula we're going to see at Baylor. So uh, I think that means you could start to see some 2024 success sooner rather than later. What does it tell you? The Baylor was ranked pretty high early on. You've mentioned that, how it was it stayed consistent. We all were ready for Baylor to drop out of the top 25 at some point because you, you've talked about it. The, the quantities there early on, you're ranked high, then the quality starts to play in a factor. You're looking at a Baylor squad, though, that it's like half these guys when they first committed. I'm going to look at their recruit player profile. There's nothing there. There may be like two stars if they even have – if they exist online. And then yeah. six months later, everybody else is knocking at their doors. But the fact that Baylor was there first has really given them such a strong class, these diamonds in the rough. What does it say about this staff to be able to target guys that somehow wind up pretty squarely on major maps by the time this thing's all said and done. It says everything. I mean, that's how you build a, a long-standing, stable roster, right? I mean, these these number one players, you know, making their decisions on ESPN on signing day, it's great, right? The number one receiver is committing, and he throws the Georgia hat, and he puts on the you know Ohio State hat. That is fun and and really uh, engaging to to look at. But everybody knows that's a great player, right? But but now all of a sudden, four or five schools put so many resources into that kid, and they didn't get him. So do they now just not take a receiver? Are they now lighter from a quantity perspective? I think it's 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 a double-edged sword where people kind of look down on the schools that fill up early, like Baylor, like Texas Tech that we just talked about. Duke, Notre Dame this year was full pretty early. But when it comes closer to signing day, like right now, and you, you scan the rankings here, and I'm going to do so right on the air, a lot of these schools still under 20 commitments, right? And now all of a sudden – do you either settle for a recruit because you want to hit a number or are you trying to rely on the portal, which there's no coach outside of Lane Kiffin that will admit it's OK to rely on the transfer portal as as a supplement to high school football recruiting and junior college football recruiting. That is still going to be the foundation of all of these uh, great teams and teams that are, are able to su have sustained success in, in the win loss column. So I do think there's something to be said for those programs that recognize that early and fill up early. And again, you're not doing it from a settling perspective. Look at where Baylor has done it. It's at the premium position perspective, O-line, D-line, quarterback, defensive back. There is not a program in the country that has enough of those positions full. So to have them already done and kind of shored up in recruiting by the kickoff of the season, it really allows you to, again, pour into – the kids that are still on the bubble, the kids that might uh, flirt with other programs or start to turn the page towards the next cycle so you could do it all over again. Yeah, Oregon and Miami both ranked ahead of Baylor with 18 commits right now. Baylor at 25 is kind of the outlier uh, over the course of the top 16 teams you look at, which I think does say a lot that that many guys have stayed on and Dave Aranda's probably not going to go to the transfer portal to find more than one or two guys, which Correct. could pay dividends and has so far. Uh, John, I, my favorite segment, uh, we do this like once every three times that you're on, is John's thoughts, and it's just John's thoughts. But before we get to those thoughts, I got to tell the folks at home about Bet Online. BetOnline.net is where the game starts. Right now, you can go there. My number one source. This past weekend, I had a pretty good weekend again. Uh, you know, Kansas, TCU kicking off all the big games, got to watch, kind of sit back a little bit. Usually on your bye week, you wouldn't care that much about football. Well, I did because you sprinkle a little money on some of these games and it makes you a little bit more tuned in, a little more interested too. 
Uh, so betonline.net is where that I, where I do that. It is where the game starts and where you can find up to the minute scores for every sport out there. Accurate lines. You can go make a bet on Baylor to win the Big 12 championship still today. They have news, podcast, in-depth analysis, and articles. Head to betonline.net. Use your mobile device to learn more. That is betonline and is where the game starts. Check on check it or check out betonline.net. John College Football. Circa 2007, but make it 2022. They say that everything comes back around every 15 or 20 years. Well, 07 is back at as good as ever. This, this maybe I'm just it, every year people are like, oh, it's a crazy year. This actually feels like a lot more parity than usual. Uh, 100%, right? I mean, I think the combination of really, I think it started with the wacky carousel last year, right? 21 Power 5 jobs, I believe, changed hands. So you had a combination of good coaches or up-and-coming coaches inheriting decent rosters and then supplementing with late additions. And then after that, you had the fallout of, okay, well, now we see these guys making moves, so now we are going to go maybe enter the portal a little bit more or play this young guy a a little bit sooner. Basically – Everyone's taking more risks, it feels like. And it certainly has led to more coaching carousel craziness. I think we're at five or six yeah. jobs already. I mean, the Wisconsin one is crazy, right? That one is like, yeah. No, I don't, I don't know who saw that coming. I did not. Um, but look, uh, by the time this podcast airs, uh, Auburn uh, could could have made its yeah. move. A bunch of other programs are going to get closer to, to that point as well. So you, you get so much turnover. Um, and everyone feels like they're playing, coaching, recruiting for their jobs. So you see it just an a upped level of, of talent. And I think the portal as a supplement, not as a primary support, but as a supplement, like we've talked about, has really uh, shaken the sport up, right? How many of these upstart programs, again, I'm going to do some uh, some talking and scrolling at the same research. time. How many of these upstart programs have a new coach, coach and or new transfer portal quarterback oh. leading them, right? I mean, you talk about uh, USC at number six, right? Uh, they they satisfy both of those. Ole Miss right there at number nine, they satisfy both of those marks. Oregon at number 12, right? I mean, the list really goes on and on. I mean, TCU, we just talked about Sonny Dykes. Both both categories satisfied there. So I do think that's a part of it. And, and look, seven programs are new into the AP Top 25 this week. I mean, so yeah, it, it is chaos every single week. And off air, we, we do these staff picks at SI where we, we just pick games straight up, right? We pick the yeah. winners straight up. Uh, yours truly won the pool last year, and I'm leading right now, fingers crossed. But the point I bring up is not to <laughs> gloat. It's that this this past weekend had me like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I was so back and forth on some of these games. And optically, if you look at the logos – that should not have been the case, right? Yeah. TCU Kansas should not have put me in a bind from a decision-making standpoint. That should be a click and go, yeah. and, and it wasn't the case. And that was true in, in all the Power Five conferences uh, itself. I mean, even BYU Notre Dame had me stumped. I was like, yeah. mm, that, that shouldn't happen. So I think that is that is the beauty of college football this year, and it's because of the transition. I think that's my long-winded way of saying the transition with the players – and the coaches all moving simultaneously has created a parity because the uh, high-profile coaches went to other high-profile, high-ceiling jobs, right? USC, LSU, Notre Dame, Florida, et cetera, Miami. Now, and then the the portal kids moved for opportunity, right? Yeah. So, you know, your your Jalen Daniels is, or these guys moved to, hey, I want to I want to have an opportunity under this kind of system to maybe be the guy. Uh, so I think that combination has created a lot more parity in the short term. But I think that's the beauty of it, because in the long term, I do still believe in in kind of how Baylor is doing it. You still have to build it through your own development and not rely on the portal. Good for a sprinkle of talent, but it shouldn't be your, your primary supplier of talent. Look at you, John. It all goes back to Baylor. It all just circles <laughs> On its this way show, back. It does. Yes, sir. The it was beautiful. I was sitting now that I'm with Inside the Bears. By the way, for those who don't know, John's the one that helped get me that job. So thanks, John. Uh, I'm Anytime. sitting with my buddies in the living room, and I read now all the SI stuff uh, that as as if I didn't already. I really do with a keen eye now. And I'm reading your picks. My my roommate goes, "Yeah, well, it's not against the spread. It's just straight up. So that's super easy." No. Not this year. No, sir, buddy. It's just 
that West Virginia got beat by Kansas by double digits in overtime at home. None of that sentence makes sense at yeah. all. Uh, but it's it's the way that college football is this year, and I, I love it. Uh, I know we're going to get you out of here, John. What is, where can people go to find your stuff and those picks every week as they utilize Bet Online? Yeah, si.com slash college is, is your uh, one-stop shop there uh, for recruiting and football talk. So we do a little bit of both there with yours truly. And, of course, find me on Twitter. I'll be uh, tweeting uh, through the weekend, uh, past the bye week, into recruiting, all of it at John Garcia underscore JR. Boom. Beautiful stuff, as always, folks. As the week rolls on, it's West Virginia and Baylor on Thursday. We'll preview that game coming out because if the Bears lose it, the floor gets a lot more realistic. But if they win... There's still the chance, still the chance that a Big 12 title, even with a couple of losses, is at play. Drake Tolfman inside the Bears alongside John Garcia Jr. from Sports Illustrated. Come back tomorrow as things only get more fun this week at Locked on Baylor. <laughs>